that advantage and, uh, and talk some more about I2C. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Let's put up those, those timing diagrams again because that's what we're going to look at. I want to look at a couple data sheets of other devices and get you kind of understanding this protocol a little better. So go to MATLAB here. <clears throat> so we've got our two generic. Now again, I'm not saying that all chips do exactly what I'm showing here, but from what I've found, most devices, most I2C devices, perform the, it, uh, this I2C in this fashion, I should say. Uh, and so let's say create plot, write data. And you know, we'll, I'll show you today. La last night I was just looking through some other data sheets to show you some examples. And as I'm reading through them, I have little question marks. Oh, I would have to try that out to see if it actually does work or not, you know? So there's always question marks when you're reading through data sheets on what exactly you need to do. But the, the, the gist, when you're writing out to a device, more than likely, the device, the I squared C device that you have, has multiple registers. Multiple, I, the, some of the chips that I read last night, they talk it up. There's a pointer pointing to the register that you want to talk to, right? Uh, and so, <clears throat> what you first do when you're writing out to a device, you send the slave address, okay, which can be a seven bit address number between 1 and 127. Actually, 0 cannot be used. 0 is an address that all devices on the bus would listen to. If for some reason you needed to broadcast something to all chips, which I've never had to use address 0, they reserve address 0. But then address 1 through 127 is legal for you to use, uh, the only catch is, does a device out there have the same address as you? And obviously you can't have that. So you'd have to figure that out. And I'll show you with some of these chips how you can manage the addresses of your devices on, on your I2C bus. Then, because we're writing, the eighth bit, or bit zero of, remember, most significant bit is sent first. The eighth bit is our read or write bit, and we issue a write bit. Okay. So by the way, you know, for project three to get kind of checked off, of course you want to get the communication working and get the data from both your uh, real-time clock chip and the DAN 2827 chip. But I also want you to put this, uh, you know, up on the oscilloscope and show me where's the start condition, where's your acknowledges and all that kind of stuff so you get a little better understanding. So if this is confusing to you, hopefully it gets a little less confusing as we look at it on the oscilloscope, just like we did with SPI. And then after this, if the device is out there, it acknowledges, right? It pulls the chip select line low. Remember that with this um, I squared C protocol and the serial port, the SCL line and the SDA line are pulled high through a resistor, through a pull-up resistor. So if there's no device out there, and none of the devices pull the pin low, then it's going to float high or go high because of the pull-up. Not float high, but actually be pulled high through the pull-up. And that's its way, that, that's why the signal will not stay low, right? And so it wouldn't be acknowledged, right? There wouldn't be acknowledged if there's no device out there. But if there is a device, it pulls the, uh, the acknowledge line low, and then uh, the master sees that he's out there and says, okay, great. Now he sends, or whatever, sends out the address of, now let's see, that's different. We, we got kind of like, we got to think about our, you know, zip code and then the address to our house and all that kind of stuff, right? Kind of thinking those analogies. We've got our address that selects the chip that we want to talk to, right? And then we've got the register address inside the chip. Okay, which of the registers do we want to talk to? And that's what's there, and I happen in this diagram saying I want to talk to register six, whatever that is in the data sheet. And then I send out the data that I want to store at register six, right? It could be a setup register, it could be, in our case, 
uh, with the Dan 2027, it's going to be one, a high byte or a low byte of a PWM command. Okay, it's just what I designed it. Uh, and so that data goes into register six. Where do you think data two goes in? What register does data two go into? That number 12. Register seven, register seven right? And then data three, this 200, whatever, 8-bit uh, value, goes into register eight. And then data register uh, nine, right? And whatever that is on the device, okay? So and with I squared C, at least with the standard I squared C protocol, I, I don't know what's happening with, there's a new uh, protocol, uh, just like, I don't know, eight I squared C, version 2 or whatever it's at or whatever. I, I think they also still just transmit with 8 bits. SPI, we kind of saw we could transmit 8 bits at a time. We could transfer 16 bits at a time. We can change that up with SPI. With I squared C, at least for now, it's always 8 bits. Everything is, comes out in 8-bit chunks. Okay? And then, because we all we wanted to do is write 4 bytes, our stop condition happens at the end of writing out that 4th byte. Okay, and then we're done. And the chip is will use that those values or, um, yeah, it will do whatever it needs to do with those values that got sent across. So that's what we call a write command across the I squared C. A read command is a little bit more complicated. So let's run that. <clears throat> Okay, so and just to review this again, because uh, now you could probably come up with a scenario where you didn't need to send across what register you want to start reading from. If there's a way, you know, because this pointer inside the chip, you know, kind of goes from register two or whatever, six, seven, eight, whatever it's pointing to, and probably when it gets to its end register, it may reset back to register zero. So you could probably come up with a scenario to kind of, I don't know, it's trick the system or work the system optimally that you wouldn't have to send over the, the start register that you want to start reading from. But most of the time, you do. Most of the time, you have to tell the device, hey, what register do I want to start reading at? Okay. And as I said, some of these data sheets I'm going to show you, they call this a pointer uh, value. What What is where are we pointing to inside the device? So again, we same thing. We send out uh, our slave address. And right now, we want to still do a write. And that's what gets a little confusing. We're really, in the end, we're reading bytes. But at first, we've got to write out to this device. And what are we writing out? We're just writing out one 8-bit value. And it's the register we want to read from. Okay, and so that's what we see up here. We send out the slave address and then this register address inside the I squared C device. And then, of course, if it acknowledges all these, if the slave device says, I'm out there, then <clears throat> now the slave device knows what we want to read. Okay, so we actually go and issue an, an additional start condition. Just that's the way I squared C likes it. And you send the slave address again. Okay? So um, we send the slave address, but notice the difference. We send the slave address now with the read bit high. The read write bit, right? Low for write, high for read. Okay. Then <clears throat> uh, the slave acknowledges, yep, I'm out here, I'm ready to send things back to you, things that the master is going to read, the master still controls the clock, but during this time, the slave controls the data line, doesn't it? Because it needs to send data back. That's, you know, that's, if you kind of get what I'm doing here with this red, I'm kind of saying, right here, this is the slave taking over the data line. That's why these coming in from high above or whatever, I don't know however you want to think of this. But the main reason I did this from high above is because my flat line is way up here that I'm taking out of the axis of my plot, 
right? <laughs> so it's kind of, anyway, very, very good. But um, <clears throat> so th this guy um, is, the slave is taking over the device and then the master acknowledges, say, yep, I got the data from you. I'm ready for another eight bits or whatever, okay? And the master will clock out that clock, pulling in the data it knows it needs to get, however many bytes it wants to pull in from that device, okay? All right, so yeah, a little more complicated. But now let's, let's take uh, and look at the source code that I gave you that explains this now. Okay, so let's go back to, the, well, we're at the read. Let's do the read first since it's very similar. Um, go to my code composer here. <clears throat> I cut and paste the code you're given in the project. So here it is. This is our read two 16-bit values, which if we're reading two 16-bit values, I squared C does everything in eight bits. That means you need to read four eight-bit chunks. And two of those 8-bit chunks will be put together for one 16-bit value and the other two for the second 16-bit value, okay? Now, uh, <clears throat> this is almost the code you need for the DAN 28027 chip I2C. But I changed the register names, or not names, the number, the register you need to read from or whatever. I changed that up a little bit so you have to think about, you know, what does the Dan 28027 need okay, to be talked to? So anyway, so here, what are we doing? And again, I'm, I'm hiding some of the register settings from you here. I mean, I show you the numbers. You could go investigate what this all does. Uh, but that's not the point as much for this exercise. The point is more understanding what the, not what code necessarily the 28027, sorry, 28379D needs register wise, but more, what do we need to send across to our slave device, to our I squared C slave device to communicate with it, its protocol. Anyway, so <clears throat> what do we do first? Well, and this is one of the things that I have not, I'll admit, I have not sat down with I squared C and really tried to figure out the issues when a device is not out there, we get no acknowledgements and all this kind of stuff. When, so some of my things are just, if, if the I squared C device is busy, I give up. And I say, well, we'll try it the next 20 milliseconds and see if he's not busy. It's kind of what I do right now with my error checking. There are, there, so I'm not using any interrupts, but there are ways to get an interrupt for a no acknowledge. You can get an interrupt for a, a da data mistake or whatever, whatever these different error, um, interrupts are that kind of uh, kind of help you understand when there's an error on the bus, okay? I think there's a, yeah, anyway, I can't think of the name of it, but there's a couple extra signals that we could be monitoring to know when there's an error. What my ignorance is, I don't really know what to do when there's an error to claim it all. What I mainly do is I reset the I squared C device and try it again, okay? Maybe not the best. I'd love to have some time to investigate that even better, but, and that could be something for a final project if that's something you're interested in. So anyway, so that's what's happening here. <clears throat> if for some reason we come into this function and the I squared C is busy, I just say, okay, forget it. I'm not gonna try. I'll try the next time you call the function. Okay, well, if that keeps on giving us errors, that's a bad thing. What I find is I only usually, that usually only happens to me the first time I call for some reason. And again, I haven't taken time to figure that out very well. Uh, so it doesn't happen very often, but that's what's going on here. Now, if your device isn't out there or a wiring mistake happens, you know, let's say we just didn't solder a wire correctly for our SDA and SCL lines, we kind of creep to a halt and it's kind of hard to debug, okay? So we'll, we'll get there. Hopefully we'll, we'll figure that all out. Well, we will figure that all out as we get into your project. Okay, then <clears throat> I, I'm sitting here and notice there's a bunch of while loops in this, okay? So this is code that you would not put in an interrupt because it's not deterministic. Those while loops could take quite a long time. Especially if we just think about it, we're shifting up eight bits 
and we're sitting and waiting in a while loop for those eight bits to go across. Well, the fastest, we're gonna clock out data at 250 kilobits per second. So one over 250,000, that's what, four microseconds, I think, right? And so you're clocking out eight of those, that's 32 microseconds. That's a long time on this, on our processor, okay? When we're getting an interrupt every millisecond, for example, and we're doing about four or five loops, uh, while loops up here, okay? So anyway, uh, we're gonna do all this code, and I'm gonna show you here in a little bit, we're gonna do all this code up in our while loop. So it's interruptible, and all our more important code will be able to stop this code, jump to other important code, and then come back to communicating with our I squared C. Okay? All right. So, good. So, these first ones, just kind of getting everything, making sure everything's ready to go on our SPI, on our I squared C serial port. Then, <clears throat> what do I do? This happens to be the address that I, of my chip XYZ you're going to have to go figure out what the address of the DAN 28027 chip is. You're going to have to go figure out what the address of the BQ32000 chip is. Where do you find that? In the data sheet. Okay? Um, it's not hex 25. Okay? Then we're doing a read. So, but notice we're going to do a write instruction. And really you only know that by my comments right here because you really don't know, you could go investigate what this hex 6620 means. But um, what's happening is we're gonna write out one 8-bit byte. And that's gonna be the register we wanna start reading from. Okay, uh, just like our read cycle did. So, uh, and we'll come back to that. So what are we gonna do in here? We're gonna say, all right, I wanna write out one byte, that's this I2C count, how many bytes do you want to write out? One byte. We want to write out, what do, data do we want to write out? We're writing out decimal 10. So I'm here saying I want to read from register 10. Okay, that's where, so I'm assuming that uh, there is 10 registers. Well, I know by looking at the data sheet of that. The DAN 28027 doesn't have 10 registers. So obviously that's wrong for the DAN 28027. Anyway, I'm writing, reg writing, well, writing to register, writing out the number 10, telling the I squared C device that that's where I want to start reading. Okay? And then I issue <clears throat> right here this command which starts everything going. This will start the transmit and <clears throat> it actually will, when it's done, not issue a stop command. Okay? because right away we want to issue another start command. <clears throat> Let's see, and then I sit here and wait. Yeah, if I don't, if no one's out there, I return an error, if no acknowledge, but then I wait for that data to be shifted across when transmit is ready. All right, X is for transmit, R is for receive. X mit and re uh, receive, R ready. So I sit there and wait for that to uh, send out. So what have I done? I have this code right here. I have finished this much, oops, what did I just do? This much of our timing diagram. I've set, instead of 78, I've sent out hex 20, unless 78 is hex 25, maybe it is. I don't think so. But anyway, okay, um, I've sent out hex 25 right here. I've sent out register 10, agree with me in that code? And, I've, uh, and I'm done when I've just sent out the one byte, okay? All right, so that's where I'm at in the code there. And then I'm waiting for that transmission to be done. When that transmission is done, I need to issue, I gotta send the uh, slave address again to 25, hex 25. I gotta say that I wanna read four things, I2C count, <clears throat> and then this crazy 6C20 is saying, hey, I wanna issue a read command with, uh, when I'm done, it, it can issue a stop condition is what that says. Okay, I think that's right. Let's see, do I change that anywhere else? No, I don't. 
Okay, so yeah, so that at the end of when count equals zero. So this I2C count, whenever you've trans are received or transmitted eight bits, it decrements, right? And when it gets to zero, you're done and it issues a stop condition if you've told it to do a stop condition. Okay? All right. So <clears throat> we've set it to four. We issued the command. We check was there no one acknowledge? If there was not a, no acknowledge, we sit here and wait for re ready, receive ready. In other words, have we received our first 8-bit value? I'm sitting and pulling. It, are, are you done? 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 When it's done, what do I do first? I go and read the value. So here's the I2C's data register, data receive register, whatever that exactly what that means. DR, data register receive, I think is what that stands for. And we're going to save that 8-bit value into this value, value 1 LSB. Okay? On this device, on the, on the chip XYZ, the, the first byte you get at register 10 happened to be a least significant byte of a 16-bit value. On another device, it could be the most significant byte or something else, right? You've got to look at the data sheet to figure out what it is. All right. So we get that value. <clears throat> then again, there shouldn't be a no acknowledge, but I'm checking it anyway. And then I sit, because count now is still three, the master knows to clock out another eight bits and receive another eight bit value. So I sit there and wait for the second eight bit value coming back. This would be the value that was sitting in register 11, isn't it? Because we started at 10. When that's done, we go and read value one's most significant byte. Okay? <clears throat> and again, uh, you know, knowledge, weight, read in the next byte, which would be the value that was sitting at register 12. And it happened to be a least significant byte. Let's check again, wait till we receive the last byte, <clears throat> and that uh, would be in value two its most significant byte. And because now count on the I2C device has counted down to zero, the, uh, mas the master I2C device knows to pull the line high to create the stop condition, right? Okay? And so it does that automatically. And that's why we're done. We don't have to sit and wait anymore. We just read it. And then we use those values, don't we? We take those most significant and least significant bytes and put together our two 16-bit values. Do all I2C chips have 16-bit values? No. All right. So I'm have more uh, bytes, maybe 32-byte byte, byte register, you know, values that you got to go read. But you're always reading 8-bit chunks at a time with I2C. Okay. All right. Good. Always interrupt me if you have any questions about that. But that was it, right? So we saw that we didn't really go back to the timing diagram. But, right, we sent that slave address again with reading. And then here was our value that was at register 10. Here's the values at register 11, 11 register 12, and register 13 happen to be for this fictitious chip, right? This is just something I'm showing you. Um, that's very similar to what I did for the Dan 28027. Okay. Good. Then, of course, now the writing is a little bit simpler. Let's look at that code really quick. A little bit. I mean, you just don't have to issue that second start command. Uh, see, here when we want to write out data by, for the Dan 28027, this is two PWM values. Coming back to that PWM command. And it's our RC servo command again, where 1500 to 4500 is our range, and 1500 is 4% duty cycle, and 4500, did I say it right, is 12% duty cycle, right? Just like we did in lab three or whatever it was, similar to that. Okay, uh, but that PWM is being created by the, the DAN 28027 chip. But here, this is the fictitious chip XYZ, and what are we doing here? We are, do, same address, hex 25, for our fictitious, fictitious chip, 
And then we're going to send over five things. Even though it's just two 16-bit values that we're sending, we have to send five because the first thing is the register that we want to start writing to, right? So that's why there's five in our transmission, okay? And so we come down here, and this is our command to say, issue a, a write command with a stop condition at the end. Again, you'd have to go look at those bits in this I, I2C MDR register and figure out what all those mean, okay? Again, we're, we're not doing that for the project. If you, again, if you're more interested in I2C, we can talk about putting more details of I2C into your final project. Okay, and then we sit here and wait for the transmit to be ready to get that all out there. And when it is, we then issue our 8-bit val value that's going to register what? Going to register, the first thing we send across is 4, right? So this is going to be sent to register 4 of the uh, I2C chip, the slave chip, okay? <clears throat> and then we wait for that to be, uh, transmit to be uh, ready for another one, right? The transmit isn't ready until you can send another byte out. So it's when it's done sending that out, we go and send this, this, the third byte, right? So we've got our register four that we sent out in our DXR transmit register. And uh, then we transmit out the least significant byte for byte number two. And then we send out here byte number three, byte number four, and finally, byte number five, right here, okay? When everything's all done, you can return. If we don't get an acknowledge, that means that we've transmitted all five of those bytes, and that has caused those uh, four registers to be filled with the new command, right? With the new command that you want to have that device do, whatever that is. Okie doke. All right. So, you know, this week in lab for the project, how is this going to look in our code composer? So, we've created these functions, and you're going to be creating functions also for writing to, you know, something write BQ32000. It's all up here, actually, the, the exact names. Are right here. We're going to call it right BQ32000 right here, and we're going to pass it the second value of our time, <clears throat> the minute value, the hour, the day, the date, the month, and the year. Okay, so you're going to create a function like this. So here, the one of the nice things about this is these are all, even though these are unsigned 16, you got to remember that that's the smallest variable type on our processor. There's no such thing. I mean, actually, you could, if, if this is confusing to you, that's not a bad idea. You could call this unsigned in 8T if you wanted to, just knowing that on our processor there's nothing that's just 8 bits. It's actually an unsigned in 16T, okay? When, but if you would call it an 8, unsigned in uh, 8t, it only uses the bottom eight bits of that right, of that value, okay? So, personally, I like to keep it 16 just to remind myself that it's always, there's no such thing as an 8-bit anything on this processor, because that can really confuse you later. But anyway, okay, so um, these are the things we're going to send out. So, as I said, the good thing is these aren't 16 bits, so you don't have to send like a least significant bit, most significant bit of the seconds, and the least significant of the minute, most significant of the minute. All you have to do is send these across, but I'm going to get to their format. Their format's a little weird, and I'll explain. But we, so we were going to have to send out one byte, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But because we have to send the register that these need to go to first, you'll actually be sending eight bits up across, right? So the register that you want to start writing to, and then the seven bytes of the second minute, hour, etc. Okay, so that'll be uh, for your BQ. Now, <clears throat> because all we're doing this week is take running these functions, 
and then just printing them to serial printf, technically you could just put all these functions right here. I don't want you to, but it would be kind of the same thing. Write, you would just call these, write Dan 28027 RC servo. You know, and you put your parameters in there, of course. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll put comma, 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 all your parameters in there. So you call that right there. And so what would happen, and then we're going to print them. We're going to print the values. Well, and in this case, what red is read back. We'll print the two ADC values inside our serial printf function. And I think I ask you to do that every 100 milliseconds or something like every 200, whatever it is, in the uh, project. So now... Um, that's fine, but I want to get you thinking about in this exercise the idea of flagging another very uh, another flag like this UART print. Because when we get to the final project, there especially a lot of you may choose to use the FFT fast Fourier transform or other larger algorithms that take depending on how much data, for example, you take the FFT of. It can take, you know, a half of a millisecond or, you know, a whole millisecond if you keep on going larger and larger in data. So um, <clears throat> we want to have a place where we can call uh, long code that allows other interrupts to interrupt that code. So if we, well, the way we right now are doing interrupts, only one interrupt can go at a time. So your CPU timer interrupt, if it's in there, and your ADC interrupt happens to happen, or uh, some other interrupt that you've set up, your SPI interrupt, what happens is we let CPU timer zero finish, and then when it's done, it'll go and run the, the next highest priority interrupt. So what we're assuming there to make that work well is that the code inside your interrupt function is running pretty fast. I like to say getting done, a good ballpark is getting done in 10 microseconds or something like that. Now you guys saw that when you did a 30th order filter, what did we end up finding? We found that your code took a little longer than 10 microseconds. So you would have to think, all right, is that little uh, amount of time that you're processing code right there detrimental to some of your other interrupts? And a lot of the things we do today in our projects that probably won't be so, but definitely a half of a millisecond could be detrimental to some of our, the things we're doing. So in the final project, we're not going to really do too much of this in the lab, but in the final project, for example, if you want to take the FFT, you're going to see, we're going to pull all that data in for the FFT. You take the FFT of the microphone. And the nice thing about taking the FFT of the microphone, you can whistle and it'll give you a certain peak, right? And so you can figure out what tone's coming into the robot. That's kind of fun to play with. So some of you will probably do that. So we'll collect all the data down in the ADC interrupt, but we, uh, especially if we're sampling at a really fast rate, we can't run the FFT down at the interrupt level. So instead, when we're ready to run the interrupt, what we'll do is we'll set another flag. And so something like this, you'll have an if run FFT equals one, then in here, right, just like we have UART print equal to one here, we will right here say run FFT equals zero just to reset our flag. And then we'll call our, you know, uh, calculate calc, FFT function with all our data or something like that, right? Now, by putting this code up there, yes, it's important that we figure out what the FFT is, but is it important, you know, to know uh, that FFT exactly as long as it takes to make run that code? No, usually we don't. We have some time there. If it's off, even probably a, a, a millisecond there, it'd be okay, if not more. Because what are we doing with that toad? Maybe the robot will be told to go backwards instead of forwards or something like that. And if it doesn't recognize that, you know, plus or minus a couple milliseconds, that's not going to be any different usually to your control. But it depends. Maybe some case it would be, and then you would have to organize your code a different way. 
But uh, in this case, most time, but what we're saying here is I want to run this FFT as low priority code. And so it's interruptible when you put it out here at the while loop. The more important interrupts can run and then come back and finish, then you can come back and finish the FFT. Well, the reason I'm saying this is that it's exactly the same thing I want us to do with our I2C this week in project three. I want you to set another flag. If run I2C funks or whatever you want to call it, right? If that equals one, I want you to, um, you know, of course, run I2C funks equals zero. And then you run all these functions, right? This is the declaration of them, right? You understand that. But control X, so it's like this without the declaration, you would actually call these functions right here, okay? Well, would you call the right function? No, the right BQ2, BQ32000 should only be called once and that should be called up in main because that's what you're writing to your clock. If you write to your clock every time this is called, the time won't change, will it? Right, because you're writing a certain time. So it's just like setting your watch. You only do that once, and then you just go and read your watch, don't you? So this function will be told to call outside of the while loop once, right, to set everything up, to set your, battery, your watch, and then you'll read it every time you flag that variable. Now it is true that probably we're going to both flag this function to run and flag this to print at the same time. Yes? So technically, as I said, you could put this code up in here, but I don't want you to. I want you to think about this idea of scheduling another low priority thing up in the while loop. Okay? And yes, the next loop, it'll just go and print it, but I'm trying to get you to think of that. Okay? Good. Let's, yeah, we got eight minutes. Let's talk about this crazy format. Has anybody, have you ever heard of BCD? format binary coded decimal I hardly ever use it but with these real-time clock chips they seem to like to use it and there's probably a good reason let's let's uh, let's think about this here if I go to the uh, do I have it up here where's my uh, BQ 32,000 data sheet Here we go. BQ condensed. All right. So let's go down to one of these registers. All right. Here we go. The seconds register. Let's just look at it. So it would make a lot more sense to me, but again, I think it's just kind of some. Somewhere along the line with real-time clock chips, I think they used to work with these chips by you would read four bits at a time, a nibble, they call it. Now we got a byte and then four, a half of a byte is what's called a nibble, four bytes at a time. And we know a four bytes is one, uh, is one uh, hex digit, isn't it? Every four bits is a, did I say bytes? Every four bits is a hex digit. Well, so to talk to this seconds register, okay, the bottom four bits is your, your ones digit of the seconds. The upper, and notice, you know, we got this, for the upper, so what, what is it for the seconds, the tens, ones digit, sorry, goes between zero and nine, doesn't it? Zero and nine, nine needs eight, nine and eight need four bits, don't they? Because seven is one, 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 but we need eight and nine, so we need four bits to determine our ones digit of seconds. And we need, <clears throat> well, because the tens digit goes from zero to five, really you only need three bits up there. And then we got this, I don't even know, the stop oscillator. Okay, so if you write a one to this, then your real time clock chip's not going to keep track of time anymore. So I really don't know, I guess, I don't know why you need to run that. Maybe if you're doing some calibration or something. There are some calibration registers that we're not going to look at. But anyway, so to send over, say, 39, right, we don't send over 
like we can't go to our calculator This would make our lives easier, but it's not the way it works. So programmer, if I put in decimal 39, notice right here, that is not what we're sending across. If we sent across decimal 39 like this, that would be setting our seconds to 27. Do you see that? The bottom four, these four bits is seven. This, these four bits are two. So instead, what we got to send across is the value 39, which would be 0, 0, oh, let's clear this, 0011910001. Did I do that? Oh, boy, I didn't clear all, sorry. Now let's get down to word, sure. Okay, what did I say? Um, so 39, 0, 0, one 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 zero zero one. What is going on? Oh, I'm in decimal. Thanks. Sorry, guys. Uh, I'm sorry. In binary. So again, zero zero one one for three one zero zero one. So that's what we got to send across, which is hex thirty nine. Hmm. Okay. Which is decimal fifty seven. Okay, so how in the world do we do this? I'll let you think about this a little bit. But if we want to send over the value hex 39, what code do we have to do? You can look at, I, don't, I looked at it over the weekend, look for conversions. I, I forgot about this thing called BCD, binary coded decimal, but it's a way you can represent some of the, this is the representation here. And so I looked at like, is there some nice, functions for converting between BCD and binary. I couldn't find anything that I really liked. But it, it mainly is it's pretty easy. So what do you do? If you want to send over, so for example, you're going to get the, in seconds inside this function. Let's, let's see here. Inside the right servo right here, this function, you'll have something like sec. Now, of course, you're not going to put your function right here, right? But seconds will have in it, you know, when you're passed, to, that's the wrong function, right? down here, this function down here. But seconds that you're passing in will have maybe the value 39, right? Now, what do you have to send across? You're going to need another register. Maybe you'll call it sec reg, right? What is sec reg equal to? Well, it's not just equal to 39. What do you have to do? You have to take and uh, find the nibbles, don't you? So you've got to say sec reg equals, well, the upper four bits, what is that? That is um, second, come on, down. second, I can't spell, but anyway, you know what it is, second, and then we have to, let's see, we have to divide by 10. And that'll truncate it and it'll give us three, agree? Okay, we've got to take this value. We've got to do what to it? By how many? It's got to be the upper four. That three's got to get in the upper four. Agreed? Plus, we got to take now the, the, that's the bottom eight bits is easy. That's just second modded with 10. What do you think about that? I'll give you a lot of time to think about that. <laughs> okay? Good. So that's a little great. And then going the reverse way, when we read in this BCD value, you got to do something so kind of like that, right? You got to figure out what your tens digit is and what your ones digit is, put them, put them together to make the 39, 40, 41, 42, whatever the seconds value is. And this is the same for your hour value, your day, well, not the day, the year, whatever. Yeah, all those, you have to look at how those are formatted. Okay, great.